<laughs> Bitch, get in it. I was pointing at Sophie because you could hear a scratch and... <laughs> Those were very disappointing sounds. No, they were fine. I think they were very disappointing. Maybe it's just that everything... Yeah, hold on. People, give us just a moment, please. Ready? Much better. Okay. Save that for later. We got our backups open. <laughs> All right. Um, I'm, I'm captain of the bit today. Okay. And, um, and this is what I want to do. Mm-hmm. I want you to take, let's say, 10 seconds. Oh, hi, Sophie. I told you she'd join us if I put the towel on that damn chair. <laughs> her, her ears just like popped over the edge of a box of wheat thin. <laughs> Sophie's got some things to say about savages. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Sophie. Sophie. Could not have been better timed. Okay. I want you to take, take 10 seconds mm-hmm. and just like focus in on a, a certain scene, a certain <laughs> moment. <laughs> mm-hmm. Ruminate on it. Let it stew. Mm-hmm. Let it marinate. Let mm. it rest. Mm-hmm. Let it, um, um, I don't know, whatever you do with chili where it sits in the fridge for a day and then it tastes better the next day. Let it build up. Let the, let the let pressure it, build. Let it marry. Um, let it grow. <laughs> <laughs> right? We're going we're gonna to take like 10 seconds of silence. You're both going to do this. And then when I say go, I want you to just unleash it. The way that I felt about it or like what it looked like, like what I saw. The way you felt about it. Okay. Uh, Does not have to make sense. I'm going for a, like an experience. Okay. Right. I'm I'm on it. An experience for the listener, not for Mm -hmm. us. I was there. Mm -hmm. I know what it was like for you. So we're going to take, we're both going to do this. Okay. And then we're going to do three, two, one. And then we're just going to let it go after we let it grow. Okay. Okay. Got it. All right. Ready? Mm -hmm. And ruminate. Hmm. Hmm. Mm Hmm. All right, three, two, one. Oh, feelings. I waited so fucking Nothing. long. More I waited than so long. Feelings. I waited so long for you people to know that this was gonna happen. I waited so long. It was really good. <sighs> I was telling Julie, I think we need to change the name of the podcast. <laughs> and with that, welcome to Duncan Lacroix Fan Club. <laughs> Drunk edition. No, I can do better than that. <laughs> Welcome to Podlander Pample Cast, a Drunklander Moose Cast. No. <laughs> Welcome to, it's just, now the name of the show is just going to be OMG Murta with white hair dot com dot org dot tiff dot net dot mm-hmm. gif. Hashtag I would hit that. Hashtag I would hit that. <laughs> um, thought. Uh, <laughs> This is, gonna back, be, this is going to be the shortest episode of the podcast in history because nah, don't ever say that because then it's the longest no, episode. But I was going to say, cause like we could just do this, like, fuck yeah. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, Good night. We Let's especially thank our like to thank Trisha McCrary, <laughs> Jen Lander Drunklin, Jen Lukowski. Um, uh, God, people would be pissed at us if we did that though, wouldn't you? Yeah. I mean, I feel like, I feel like there's probably a certain percentage of the, the listenership who, when they saw Marta pop up. Phase one, joy for themselves. Mm-hmm. Phase two, ensorcelled by the story, right? Really good scene. They're really into it. Phase three, and a distant phase three. I'm not inflating our importance in the lives of these people that <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> but phase three, for a certain percentage of the listenership, phase three would be, oh man, Allison and Julie are going to be so excited. I can't wait to hear that mess. <laughs> Mess being the <laughs> operative word. So you know what? <laughs> Fucking cheers. 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 It was great and worth the wait. Mm. I see what you did there. Mm-hmm. Y'all, I am worried sometimes that we, in our delight over the nickname that we have for Murta, had slightly overinflated our affection for him and his importance to the show. Like it's been, it's been a while. And I just, every (laughs) once in a while I worried like, man, I think maybe we, I think maybe we went too hard with this. I think we got caught up in the the romance of it all. And to what fucking 10 seconds with that guy back? I was like, Nope, not at all. Right. He's a perfect angel baby. He elevates every single thing that he touches, be it a scene, be it another actor. He just, he is the secret sauce that makes this show really good when it's really good. Mm -hmm. And I think I very much, um, 
Hi, Sophie. She Sophie agrees. agrees. Uh, I think that I missed him so much in season three, and I didn't even really realize how much I missed him until that until he was revealed. And then I was like, oh my God, thank God he's back. I'm going to be so sad when he dies. I feel, I mean, hopefully it's a ways off. Well, yeah, but it's going to happen because he's older than Jamie and we're going to see that. But like, ugh. well, I mean, probably, but you know, we all die. Yes, of course we all do. Um, I feel like we're still going to do the normal thing. Yeah. But I, I sort of wonder if maybe if we want to be able to like let our affection run free and our fancies run wild <laughs> and um, all of that shit. Maybe maybe like we get like some episode quibbles out of the way. Okay. Um, so that we can focus. Because I I will say, I think that this is the best episode of yes, this season yes, so far. Yes, By yes, yes, yes. country By mile. a mile. And yeah. it wasn't all just because of the return of Murtaugh. I mean, it helped. Yeah. It was just a more... Uh, the story was more interesting. It was uh, easier to follow. It, um, the no. costumes were incredible. Like it was just a great episode, bar none. Of course, helped by Murtaugh, but I don't think it was only because of Murtaugh. Sophie is like, where the fuck is my microphone? I feel like I need to get a she picture. She is of this. coming up to the we'll table, y'all. The slack. Yes, girl. Oh, I missed it. That's okay. She'll be back. Don't she worry. She will be back. She will be back. Um, yeah, I mean, and I, but I do think a lot of it is, and it, it's not just that Duncan Lacroix, which by the way, now confirmed. We're saying it right. We're LaCroix. saying that one we right. Are. We've always said it Thank right. You, I don't know how we did that, but we've always said that one right. <laughs> yes. Um, it's not just because he is so good, although it is definitely because he is so good. He is so but good. I think it's also some of the best moments on the show are moments that are like really rich in history mm-hmm. where there's like a lot of backstory and complicated good shit. Um, it's why all of the stuff with Coinface in the second half of last season was so good because even though he is, was just in the one season, we knew it was fucking years and years and years of friendship. Right. Um, it's why, so much of the stuff with Frank was so good because again, years and years and years of backstory. It's why we love Jenny right. and Ian and anybody who's been around the whole time or who has a long history with these characters. The show is really good about maximizing that, which is why I think it's great that they gave us two separate reunion scenes, right? Yes. Because they're two different relationships. So do you want to talk about that now or do you want to like not? We'll get there. Okay. Um, I'm just warning you because I remember last time you're like, wait a minute. (laughs) We got to go back and cut some shit out. (laughs) Well, no, I mean, they're both in this episode. Right. You see see him in the next time. Right. No, that was this episode. Oh, that wasn't in the next week on. That was this episode. I said that I thought that uh, I said he's in the next episode and then said, oh, that's a spoiler. Oh, yeah. But now I think it's pretty safe to assume he's in the next. uh, Plus, he's in the next week on Outlander. Yeah, that's what I meant. Yeah. No. Mm -hmm. Um, His reunion with Claire is in this episode. Mm, mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I got it. The two reunions, Jamie and Claire, yes. not the two reunions, Murta and who yeah, we'll talk no, about. Yeah, no, I'm talking yeah. about um, Murta gets a reunion with Jamie and a reunion with Claire, which yeah. I think is really smart and really I important. It was cool. Yeah. Um, anyway, all kinds of good shit is my point. Oh, you know, I'm wearing red and black pants, Julie. You know what she loves? No. No. Sophie, she's very involved in the podcast. Today, she really is. You she slept the whole time. We're without Janine today. He is, no joke, working at an alpaca shop. <laughs> That is fucked up. He, he's working. It, they're not selling alpacas. They're selling stuff made from alpaca, alpaca fur. fur. Hair? Yeah. It's not wool. I don't know. Anyway, fleas, whatever the fuck you call it, at Chris Kendall Martin in Chicago. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. So he is doing that. Um, anyway, so Sophie is basically Janine this week. Yeah. Good kitty. Yeah, she's come to tell us, speed it up. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I should, you know what? I should set a fucking timer on my phone. We've already fucked this up, Julie. We're nine minutes in. Okay. Um, Mm -hmm. So, um, point being, uh, lots and lots of good shit, and a lot of it is due to him. But there are some little things, and Mm -hmm. I think it's worth sort of picking those nits because it's like a similar, the last two seasons of Outlander have had a problem with just too much, right? Like too on the nose, too over explained, too literal, too heavy handed, or not quite thinking through all the details. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think there's a little of both, but they're minor quibbles. It's this episode to me felt so much more, um, literally for lack of a better term, grounded in the actual story as yeah. opposed to the telling of the and story. The Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. totally. 
It wasn't about like, ooh, look at this beautiful vista. No. Let's resonate on these themes. And I, Which, because that's the what it is. Because the themes are fucking there already. That's like, what it is. I don't, I don't no need to was, resonate on those damn themes You know anymore. what? I don't think there was a single goddamn circle. There was a bunny, though. The yeah, bunny. Yeah. The, but just it wasn't a, little a death reminder, bunny. But it just, well, kind uh, of was. No. Oh, I mean, sort of. People died, and there was a bunny. But the person who saw the bunny died. Yeah. yeah. So it was. It, it's it was there. I would like to imagine the writers' room. <laughs> Mustache was like, <laughs> wait, wait, set wait, the wait, scene wait, for no, us again. But, okay, uh, interior writers' room. Writers room. The, the writers' room. There's a big whiteboard with a bunch of cards on it, and there's one that just says circle. And then there's one that's like Claire's wigs. And then there's um, there's one with like <laughs> Rollo. Uh, and that one's got hearts and like little like arrows to the hearts. Yeah. And like there's a, there's one that says days since last sex scene. And then there's like a, and then it says like 69. <laughs> um, all that shit. And then the, a group of writers sitting around the table. The coffee, smell of coffee is in the air. Mm-hmm. And it's a bunch of ladies in the middle, like a guy. And the guy. We'll call him Matthew B. Roberts. Is uh, <laughs> it's like, damn bitches. He and he didn't write this one. You know what he but, didn't. Well, you know what? I can see it. I'm glad he didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's like, guys, guys. I've got an idea. I've got an idea. I know that Adewunde is supposed to see a deer and teach Claire how to say deer. Is that? But is me, that what happened out. in the books? No. Oh, no. no. I'm sorry, I got lost in your fantasy. Thank you. (laughs) But hear me out, hear me out. What if instead of a deer, it was a bunny? And then somebody in the room goes, genius, genius. And somebody else in the room just kind of silently closes their eyes and puts their forehead in their hand like Jean-Luc Picard. And then he goes, wait, 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 wait. What what if instead of learning mother, what if she learns to say bird? And everyone goes, no, (laughs) too much. (laughs) Every single person went, nope. Scene. Um... (laughs) But I, I mean, I think this is much better on this count than other yes. episodes have been. I do still have some quibbles. And maybe let's real quick do those quibbles. All right. Quibble one. There was a fire in the woods. Mm-hmm. And the people who live in the woods who started the fire didn't stop to make sure that they didn't burn down the whole fucking woods. Mm-hmm. I mean. Yeah, I know. Okay, so that's one. Two, speaking of fire, at the cabin, which yeah. got built in 15 minutes. Seriously, Although that's you know my what? big quibble. I recently rewatched the uh, 70s Star is Born, and Barbara Streisand and Chris Christopherson build mm-hmm. the, 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 the like cabin in the desert with their own two bare hands where they're, while they're wearing basically like lingerie and running around <laughs> on a motorcycle, and then all of a sudden a cabin exists. Nobody else is there. It's just them. Um, <laughs> And, it's, and they're just like, ah, oh, let's fuck in the sand. Don't worry about the plumbing. That'll just happen. And then like a witch comes and puts, anyway, um, it, it's like that. Not quite so dramatic and like a, an actual cabin and not a glamorous loft. Um, my whole thing with the cabin was, first of all, it was built way too fast. Secondly, appointed way too fast. Like all the furniture and shit. Where the fuck did that shit come well, from? Well, some of it got built. I know, but they just like, it, in it, at the same time as this cabin, it's like they've lived, it, uh, the interior of this in cabin looked like they'd lived there for 20 years. In the books. Um, Joe Casta is just like constantly sending servants up there with shit for them. That's funny. She sends them a bed, like mm-hmm. really early on, sends them like a fucking feather bed. Mm-hmm. Um, because... She may be shitty, but she's also all right. Yeah. She's shitty, but she's all right. Right. But she's shitty. shitty. <laughs> We're going to end on shitty. Okay. Um, anyway, she's just constantly sending them stuff. But yes, uh, in the mix, the first cabin, and I'm wondering if maybe they're just not going to do away with the big house. Um, the first cabin is much more rustic. Mm-hmm. It's all one room, which it looks like this is. Mm-hmm. Um, and the windows are shuttered. They don't have glass. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's just not quite so fancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, then they build the cabin so that they can have somewhere to live while they build the big house, which they do while they're doing everything else, too. Right. Um, so they, uh, yeah. And then as people come to join them, they speed up work on the big house so that other people can stay in the cabin. Right. Basically, uh, it becomes like the guest house. <laughs> yes, it just seemed like they had lived there for twenty well, years. Well, it's very unclear on how much time has passed because, for all we know, it's been fucking eighteen months. Mm-hmm. There is not actually any indication of how long it's been, which is frustrating. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
And also, like, it can't have been that long because we don't know shit about Marsali's baby. Nope. Why do we decide to call her? Muesli. Right. I saw some in the store the other day and smiled to myself <laughs> quietly. <laughs> Muesli. And then instantly felt more regular. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I, that's a quibble I share. Mm-hmm. Beyond that, outside the cabin, while Claire is waiting for Jamie to come home, after her very sad encounter with Herr Herr Mueller, Mueller. Um, there's a fire going outside, like in like a fire pit. Like you can tell it's like a Mm -hmm. permanent thing. Um, And yet she decides to do her ceremony she does for Adewene's hair, basically, in the house. Burning hair smells real bad. Right. No, I thought about that too. a lot of hair. And it's right there in your house. And like, also, wouldn't, if it's about honoring her and potentially and like letting her, her spirit, spirit go, wouldn't you well, want to be outside? Yeah, you want to be outdoors. Yeah. And then on top of that, I can see wrapping it in like a beautiful cloth and I can see putting flowers with it. But like the box? The box? I mean, and whatever. I, people grieve differently. Yes. Claire, you grieve however you need to grieve. On the other hand, you are living settler life. Hashtag settler life. Um, <laughs> I know apparently you own all... You made a, sh- a couple of stops at Pottery Barn. Yeah, it looks like it. You re- you've ordered a lot from Amazon. Mm-hmm. Um, but you might need that box. For something else. Right? And like, I get it. Was it the box at the beginning that she was putting herbs in? That she know. was gathering with her? Maybe. Uh, I, maybe. I didn't pay close enough attention to that, but that would that would make sense. Yeah. Because it would be like... Let's assume it's that. Okay. That makes... That kind of mitigates that but quibble still, slightly. Why but I don't know if it's it true. Outside? I know. Burning it outside I mean, would have been way scared, better. But her mother already left. I don't know. Maybe she was afraid he was going to come back. Because he was kind of unhinged and weird. He but was. And I can't believe she ever dropped that gun, though. That was a quibble of mine, too. Yeah. I know that it seems sad, but the minute he went for his satchel, I thought he was going to pull out a gun. Yeah. Like, maybe that's just the world I live in now. Ugh. But I was like, you got to keep indeed. him under gunpoint the whole time. Yeah. And she didn't. All right. Quibbles. Quibbles. That's kind about of about it. it. Do I have any other quibbles? No. I have zero quibbles with the storyline in town with Jamie and yeah. Wee and Martin. And I don't have any Roger quibbles either. No, that was fine. I, I understand why it was there, but there's part of me that kind of wishes that maybe they'd saved it for like beginning of next episode or something so that we could have had more <laughs> Murtaugh. Well, we're going to have Murtaugh <laughs> next week too. Okay. Hi, kitty. Hi. Um, yeah. Mm. I understand why it was there because they wanted to end with it with her. Touching the stone, I get that, but it was a little bit like uh, back, 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 back. Like I just want to see the Murtaugh storyline right good, now. We'll we'll get to the touching the stone, but that mm-hmm. was good too. Mm-hmm. And those boots, Ugh, I'm excited to talk about the costumes from this episode. So, yes, the costumes were very good throughout. So now we won't need to quibble. No more. Now quibbles. we can just praise. I know some of you have been a little frustrated with how frustrated we've been with the show. But hold on, if I may submit. Can those of you who were frustrated about how frustrated we were about the show admit to yourselves that this episode is incredibly better <laughs> than the first four episodes <laughs> of season four? Can we all agree? Because it was. Listen, I'm so glad that everybody liked Yogi Dick more than we did. <laughs> I'm really, really glad that everybody but Kelly Bodden. Not Hi, everybody. Kelly. There were people who there were people I'm who glad were on our side. A on that. lot of people like yes. Yogi Dick better than we did. But can we all come together and agree on this one thing? There was no need for him to go like <laughs> and yes. like do air claws. Because that was too much. Yeah. That was too much. Yeah. All right, let's back off of Yogi all Dick. Right. All right. Point all right. Me. I'm many thumbs up on this episode. All right, here we go. Outlander. God, I might fucking cry again. I really I might. did cry. All right, here we go. Well, I am very emotionally weak right now, you guys. Netflix, dogs, episode three. (laughs) That's all I'm going to say. Okay, here we go. Outlander, season four, episode five, savages. And just like Merle in the post-show thing, I'm going to go, savages. And then as it turns out to be Roberts, is going to be like, why did you say it like that? And we're all going to be like, you know why, mustache. I'm not sure why you're policing her tone, MBR. Yeah, shush. So the title card is a little doll being wrapped in some beautiful gingham fabric and being purchased. It's a, you might call it a smallpox doll. <laughs> <laughs> it looks 
looks kind of like a little jester or something. I don't yeah. know. It's weird Whatever. in the way it's that like and old, fucking old, lethal. old dolls are all weird. Yeah. You know, because they're like soft bodies and hard heads. Like, oh, what the fuck oh is that? Oh, my God. Julie, tomorrow <laughs> night's episode of Legends Tomorrow, I have to get you on this fucking show. Mm-hmm. It is you are kind of stupid. And here's how I'm going to prove it to you. Yeah. Tomorrow night's up. Sophie, it's okay. Come chat. Come Did on. Did you want up here? Sophie, join us or don't, but shit or get off the pot. Come on. <laughs> Fun fact. Uh, Sophie used to sit on my lap all the time when I had this pair of red and black got checked pants. And today I happen to be wearing a different set of red and black checked pants. She's into it. And she keeps looking like she wants to jump in my lap. I made a chair for you. Would you just get in it? No. Oh, God. We've got a very special guest. All right. Anyway. Uh, uh, <laughs> Sorry, guys. I, I can't control oh, her. Oh, she's back. Um, so another quibble. <laughs> there we go, Sophie. All right. Come here. Let's cuddle. Uh, I don't love that episode title. Yeah, well, uh, talk about how you led me into it with Pocahontas. (laughs) Yeah, so once upon a time, I had to write a list with uh, my friend and editor at Consequence of Sound, Dominic Suzanne Mayer, um, of uh, ranking every song in the Disney animated canon. That's a lot of songs, yeah. It's a lot of songs. It was like 200, and when we first did it, it was 267. Now it's more. Um, Anyway, uh, one a very low. The dead last was Canine Crunchies from 101 Dalmatians, which is very bad. Um, <laughs> somehow, Sophie was Julie was scratching Sophie's chin, and it made her spill her beer. I don't know. How I didn't it spill it. I almost spilled it. Uh, I saw droplets fly. It probably my spit. Let me move the recorder over. <laughs> uh, anyway, there's a song from Pocahontas that's very low ranking on our list called "Savages," which is the Native American. First, it's the settlers, the colonialists, the white men singing about how they're savages. They're savages. They're savages. Savages. And then it's about the Native Americans singing how the white men are savages. savages. So what I'm saying, Matthew B. Roberts, is you stole that fucking idea from, I mean, all kinds of things. It's not a new idea. But one place is a solidly Pocahontas. mid-tier Disney movie. <laughs> And it's the worst song from that mid-tier Disney movie. Anyway. Burn. Anyway, Patty. Okay, so um, we're in North Carolina, 1768. Claire, and please remind me of the Native American healer's name. Adewene. Adewene. I think, I, I think that's right. Are um, sorting herbs by a creek and just talking to each other, teaching each other their languages. And then that's when the rabbit shows up, and I'm like, fucking rabbit. And uh, Allison noticed that they both had streaks that matched her gray streaks, and she got very excited about it. Yeah, uh, Ottawa and Claire and I all have the same streaks. And what were the words? I'm headed firmly into Murtaugh territory, though. Let's be real. <laughs> what were the words that they taught each other? Mother. They learned rabbit. Tea. Hold on, my mouth is full, but I don't care. Rabbit. They inadvertently learned cap because Claire said rabbit incorrectly. Mm-hmm. And then Jamie couldn't find his hat, and I was very sad that Claire didn't go, ah, your skeet d or whatever it was. <laughs> mm, mother and T. T. Mm-hmm. Because Anawame was trying to tell her about an herb that was good as a tea for mothers. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they were learning, and it was very cool and ladylike, and like it passed the Bechdel test is what I'm saying. Uh, and then we get to the cabin and what do you know? It's fucking built. Like it's been there forever. And then you go inside and it's been there forever. It is graciously appointed. But, but there is a, uh, white sow outside rooting around in a hat. And white Allison sow. was like, very big character. I'm very happy. They've decided to show white sow. Y'all get ready. White, like Clarence, white sow is around forever. What they haven't shown yet is that the white sow is a fucking asshole. Well, we did see the first shot of the sow was rooting around in the hat that Jamie was looking for, bumbling around indoors, throwing things to side to side and opening drawers and well-appointed cabinets in a cabin that doesn't make any sense, going, where the fuck is my hat? Because I don't know how many of you are married or have a significant other or whatever. But Who happens to be male? Let's it's be al- it's I'm always male. cast aspersions on a certain gender. It's always males. Why don't they know where anything is? I don't, my objection is not, because I never know where fucking anything is. My objection is not, why don't they know where anything is? My objection is, why, when they don't know where something is, do, do they, they act assume, like, they assume you will know. Right. 
But you know what? You've hidden it from them. One of the greatest joys of my life, though, and I am about to lay something bare that does not make me look good. Oh, boy. Anytime Neil does that shit to me, where is this? Where is that? And I walk into whatever he was looking in at that moment, like that junk drawer or whatever, and just open it up. And while I look in his eyes, calmly reach in and pull the thing out and hand it to him. (laughs) I fucking love that shit. I wish he didn't, like, assume that I knew where everything was, but I know where some things are, Mm -hmm. I guess. But it's just like, oh. Oh God, I just love to pull it. Yes. My version, my version of that, which I also enjoy, also not flattering, <laughs> is when <laughs> when I'm like where I work from home. So I'm like sitting, I've got my little laptop desk that Tom got me for Christmas all set up, and I'm just like feverishly typing away about, for example, something like Bon Jovi's award-winning rose. <laughs> what? <laughs> for which I wrote an article called Bon Jovi's Rose. <laughs> Is named um, Wine Spectators Top 100 List or something like that. And then I rewrote the lyrics to fucking, um, it's my life. <laughs> it's Rosé. No, no. It's my wine. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, uh, life is a rich tapestry. And at w- one of the lyrics in it was, Grenache, Sora, and Mouvedre. <laughs> Because that's the blend. Anyway, it's a weird job I have. So I'll be typing about Bon Jovi's rosé. And he'll be like, hey, you want anything for the fridge? And I'll say, yeah, will you get me a, I don't know, cheese stick or whatever? And he's like, yeah, where are they? I'll be like, they're in the fridge. I'll be like, where? I don't see them. They're not in here. And I'll go, okay. They're not in here. (laughs) Middle shelf. He's like, no, they're not here. And then I'll go, okay. Middle shelf, like to the left. I'll be like, they're not in here. And then I stop. And I put down my computer. Yeah, yeah. You always gotta I, stop what you're doing and go do right, it. I move it, and then I walk, and then I walk, and I walk over, and I look in the fridge, and I just look at him, and then I point, and he goes, "Oh, okay, yeah, I'll exactly bring that to you." Same. <laughs> exactly the same. Thank you, honey. He's very sweet. Oh yeah, no, Neil is awesome, and you know what? Neil is also really good at finding shit when I lose it. So I've got to give some ups, yes. uh, some ups to the fish keg there. But like, <laughs> I just. It just drives me nuts. So Jamie is wandering around the Crate and Barrel store trying to figure out where the (laughs) fuck his chapeau is. And we know that the pig's already got it. Boo. And then Ian comes in with the hat and says something shitty about the pig, right? Right. And also then Claire's like, hey, will you grab me some jerky from up there? Also, why do bitches got to be telling guys to grab him shit from up top? Because I always have to make Neil get me stuff, even though he's not much taller than me. I'm always like, would you please just get that jar from that top shelf? And then he pulls out fucking tongs, just like I do. Why do I make him do it? It's because I'm afraid that shit's going to hit me in the face. <laughs> I got to protect the moneymaker. <laughs> it's just, I just do it because I'm fucking lazy. That's why. Uh, but she's like, hey, can you get me some jerky? And he's like, yeah. And in this case, he does it like he he reaches his arms up, accidentally bumps God in the face. <laughs> and he's not has to, really that tall just as reach. Like, she could have just turned around. It was right there. Yeah, but but then we don't get to see him extend. Truth. I like an extension. Hurt. Hurt. So he extends, he grabs the jerky, and it's like, oh, it's almost gone. And she says, well, there's more in the storeroom. You can get it before, if you get back before me, which is like the very polite, thoughtful, considerate way of saying like, well, gee, I wonder who could refill that. Yes. Uh, you know what else I hate? The fucking <laughs> toilet paper roll. Oh, Julie, <laughs> what is that? Julie Neil has gotten so much better about it. I, I don't want to be Tom has also gotten better. Tom has also gotten better. He's also gotten better at putting the seat down, which was a real struggle. Oh, yeah. Well, that, I've never had that problem. And that, you, Tom lived with a dude for so many years. I he, know. They didn't have to worry and about it. And he's gotten much better about it. Mm-hmm. Um, he's also now dealing with, with accidental splashes, which is great. Mm-hmm. It's very good. Anyway, this one thing. Yeah. There'll be almost no toilet paper. There'll be like two squares left. So would you say that there was not a square to spare? <laughs> there was uh, exactly two squares to spare. But, <laughs> but insufficient, spare. obviously in- insufficient for the task at hand, right. right? So he'll get another roll of toilet paper out of the cupboard, which is like right next to our no. shitter. So he can right, get another roll of toilet paper out. And then he puts it on the sink. <laughs> So you, I walk into the bathroom. But he are, leaves those two squares on there? Yes, on the oh. on the holder. So there'll be a toilet paper roll with two squares. And then to my left, a full fucking roll of toilet paper with like three squares missing. You know, because he can't just take it. He can't do it. May I submit a solution for this? Um, I don't know if what happened was, was that Neil was fully domesticated before this or not. <laughs> but... Our toilet paper roll doesn't have the thing that you have to take, literally take out. It is just a hook that you just slide the roll on and off. So is ours. Then what fucking excuse does he have? <laughs> no, 
None. None. Mm. He just, he gets it out and he just leaves it. I'm like, anyway, guys, we love you. Yes. Uh, Tom doesn't listen. Yeah. Well, Tom, Tom, I've been fucking LeBron James. (laughs) (laughs) He heard that from here. He was at home fucking watching football and just went, what? (laughs) Let me, let me adjust. I'll say, who would be really funny? Tom, I've been fucking Kate McKinnon. There you go. <laughs> he didn't, there, there's no basketball involved, so that didn't ding then on his radar. Like, mm, nothing. All right. Um, yeah, my note was men looking for things around the house. <laughs> uh, so when Claire, we just did 21 minutes on shit we're irritated about. So Claire, uh, it, when we she said says, we weren't going to quibble anymore, and instead we, we quibbled didn't with quibble our about fucking the show. personal lives. No, we didn't quibble about the show. We quibbled about the fact that Claire, our loving and supportive partners, is, is struggling back in the day with the same shit we struggle with now. It's but it's so relatable, loving and this supportive. Program. Loving and supportive. I, I I love them both. I love yours. I love mine. I love them in different ways. I love Jamie. I mean, you guys are good, and you're trying so hard. You really are. And you know what? Us ladies are trying hard, too. We're we trying, trying hard not to kill you. <laughs> so what we find out from this exchange when she says, if you get back before I do, all shady-like, is that she's going to help somebody give birth. So she's kind of like... Petronella Muda. The area's midwife. So she has to take a trip with the horse and Rollo, and she's out on her own. And then Jamie and Ian are going into town to pass out flyers to settle Fraser's Ridge and also to fix the silver candlestick, maybe? Mm -hmm. What was the candlestick about? You'll find out later. Okay. So he needed a silversmith to do him a favor with a candlestick. (laughs) Oh, did he? (laughs) That either sounds like the beginning of a porn or a really rousing game of Clue. Like, (laughs) I would suggest, submit for your consideration that perhaps he wants the silversmith to take the candlestick and turn it into something else. Oh, I see what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'll keep that to Don't myself. Don't say it. I won't. Um, so they, uh, they're they about to make their separate ways. Claire's about to leave first, and, but not before she stops by the fireplace to put on a sickening rabbit shrug. Ugh. It's like a bolero made out of five rabbits. God, the layers. And she's wearing this amazing, like, spotted wrap sweater. Mm-hmm. Like, ugh. it's gorgeous. It kind of reminded me a little bit of the monkey vest, to be said. It, the way that the fur mm. kind of stuck out. Like, I, it, anyway, I liked it. Good job, Only Terry she wasn't by. wearing it backwards. We will miss you so. I miss you, Terry. Well, presumably her team is going to take over. Right, so but this the is her last season, will right? still be really good. Mm. If they're really good right now. So <clears throat> then Jamie has a very tender moment with her where he's like, does Bree have a birthmark? And Claire's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then they have a little conversation about Bree's birthmark on her neck. And he had a dream about it. And it's like, okay, she's totally going to be here. You know, I... Uh, really had I was not sure that shit was going to play on the show mm-hmm. it is to Mr. Sam Huon's credit that it works because in the in the mix you're like oh that's sweet but man there's no way that dude is psychic he's been hitting right. the head too many times mm-hmm. but it just I don't know it makes you feel like you could honestly buy that somehow we're all connected in some fucking way and he's able to actually see her in his dreams right it's <laughs> very sweet <clears throat> And then we cut to modern times. <clears throat> and there is Roger in, who was it on the Slack channel? With the <laughs> fucking Heather. He's wearing 50,000 layers. It. Heather shared a gif of fucking Joey, Joey on Friends. Joey. Am I wearing all the clothes right now? All of the clothes. We I threw a party in college once that was, um, it was a New Year's Eve party that was also my roommate Melissa's birthday party because she was a New Year's baby. Um, and so every year we did a theme party. We loved the theme parties. Every year we did a theme party. And this year we were having a really hard time coming up with one. So we decided to make it a bring your own theme theme party Mm -hmm. where you could dress up however you wanted, but you had to be able to say what theme you were. So our friend Joshua Davis, for example, decided his theme was colors. So he showed up as the color red and he wore every red thing he owned. But (laughs) that's awesome. My friend Jeffrey showed up. And his theme was all the clothes I bought but have never worn. And he was wearing all the clothes he bought but had never worn simultaneously. And they all still had tags on. <laughs> and it looked That's like awesome. that. It was great. So it's, it is a lot of clothes. But, you know, it gets kind of cold and chilly in Scotland. It's so we very can forgive practical. Him. I actually really appreciate it because when you're trying to stay warm, nobody looks hot. No. We live in Chicago. Chicago. We, we know. are very accustomed to looking like unattractive. Ass. Just like ass. Like really unattractive. Yeah. I, I, every time I put on my snow boots, I'm like, not getting laid tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Roger slowly. Well, because you're just never going to get your boots off. <laughs> That's the other 
thing. That shit is hard to remove. I hate them. The insoles come out. Six months a year. So uh, Roger's wandering around Mooney trying to find Brianna. He goes to, what? Is it Inverness that they're in or is it another town? It's Inverness. Okay. So he ends up at the B&B where uh, Claire and Frank started this series. I'm 99% sure. Yeah, because it's Mrs. Baird and now this is Ms. Ms. Baird. Miss Baird. Um, Oh, Mrs. Baird is my mother. Call me Ms. Baird. (laughs) And he's given her the third degree about Brianna. He pulls out this stupid charcoal drawing I have no objection to the drawing. And then... But um, I also don't buy that he wouldn't have a fucking photograph. No shit. And uh, she's like real cagey about it. No, she didn't leave anything behind. And I'm all like, lies, 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 Manelli. Very obviously lying. Yes. He's... Roger. Roger. Mm -hmm. Not so good with the lies. He gonna... He ate too many biscuits. (laughs) So it just made him slow in the brain hole. Yeah, like, <laughs> did we tell you that when we were at Wizard World, we, we heard fucking, this was when we decided we loved Sophie Skelton. We heard Sophie Skelton make a biscuits joke at Richard Rankin, <laughs> where she was like, do you want a basket? I was like, like, all right. Friend of the show. Friend of the show. Work on Glad that you accent. like the podcast. And she's so much better now. So yeah. <clears throat> and then Miss, what's her name? Baird. Baird. Miss Baird. Baird is like, oh, wait, I did have this. And it's just a handwritten letter from Brie where she was like, don't give this to him until a year after I leave. But she's like, oh, but he's so sad and so covered in knits. I just have to give this to him. <laughs> you need to find yourself a nice Scottish lass. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thanks for the invite. Um, so back to the village and they're in the market. They're handing out flyers about the settlement at Fraser's Ridge. Ridge. Um, and... Uh, Jamie takes the silver candlestick to the conservatory. I'm sorry, to the... <laughs> Did you write that one down? No, I didn't. I just was thinking about Clue, bitch. And then he uh, takes it to the silversmith's house. Knock, knock, knock on the door. Silversmith doesn't answer, but Farmer's daughter does. Hot to trot. She's obviously the silversmith's wife's. You said maybe daughter? Yeah. Like, well, did they make it clear? Weird thing. So there's a character in the future in the books. Um, who's the daughter of somebody who settles on the ridge. Mm -hmm. But the guy is not a silversmith. Um, Anyway, she does a lot of like, hi, Mm -hmm. with Jamie. And I just, I can't think who else it would be. It's possible I'm forgetting a character, but Mm -hmm. there's no way that she doesn't come back, right? Oh, no, she's coming back. She comes back again in this episode. She's very obviously thirsty because she opens the door and there's Jamie. I mean, ladies amongst us who wouldn't be. Yes. Yeah, right? here, here's the thing. I think we're supposed to be like, bitch, back off. No. But I mean, come on. That's how I would be like, oh, how hi. often do you open the door and see that shit? You got to, you got to fucking, what was it that Wayne Gretzky said? You miss a hundred percent of the goals you don't take. So it's, it's like fucking, <laughs> yeah. you could just got to go for it. You got to shoot your shot. You got to shoot your shot. Um, and I just want you to know, Allison, because I just looked down, we're going to have to speed because I don't have, we're running out of battery and I don't have any more. Um, so we uh, go back to the birth cabin where Claire has just successfully delivered the baby for the Mueller's and we find out that the father of the child uh, is dead. And it, they don't really say why, but in my mind, I'm like, savages, right? That ends up being true. And they're singing a lovely song. They're a German family. It's nice. This baby's healthy. It's cool. Then we go back to the town meeting that Jamie is called, trying to get all the Scottish farmers in there, trying to sell them on this yeah, land. Profiling, right? Why it's not? True. Why aren't you asking the British settlers or the Irish? Well, definitely not asking the Irish settlers. Come on, now you're just asking for trouble. <laughs> I say that as a person with I don't know. I've never done twenty three in me, but my everybody in my family says I'm Irish, and I do like whiskey and gold. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Y'all, there was some drama. <laughs> I sincerely hope that ended in like the middle of a word and it was just like, um, something Irish to go, some gold potatoes. But and then I did that. I think you got all the gold in there though. Gold! <laughs> um, So then we said more things and then the batteries died on our recorder, but that's okay. And then Julie went and got more batteries. And then we realized that the card only saved to basically when I was running my mouth by Irish people. And then, uh, we tried to record and then it said a protected card. And then we had to Google some shit. And then I watched five and a half minutes of an Italian TV show. And then I got (laughs) Julie another beer and then, uh, Sophie hung out and both of us peed. 
And now we're here. And we're back. Okay, so he's in town meeting with the Scottish farmers, not the English farmers, not the Irish farmers. And he's trying to settle Fraser's Ridge as per his agreement with Governor Tryon to settle that land. Um, he's a Tryon he's a to tryin'. settle it? Mm-hmm. So the, they're all listening to him. And I remember this from when I said it earlier. I guess they're hypnotized by how hot he is because they're all really paying attention to him. It's probably also like he's trying to give them hundreds of acres of free land. But then all of a sudden when he says something about the governorship or you don't have to pay until the tax is later, they're all like their ass is clinch closed. Mm-hmm. And then the one that looks like Jack Black is like, fuck no, and he leaves. And then they all kind of disperse and are like, no, no, we're not going to do this. And then he sees the one that held on till the very end. And I'm, I know his name is Brian, but I'm going to call him McHattie Tartan because he was wearing the little tartan hat. And he goes over to the bar, I guess, to get more beer. And Jamie's like, I'm going to find out what the fuck is up here. You say, I guess, to get more beer. Yeah. Like, that's not... Of course, exactly what he did. Of course. Or more whiskey. No, Wesk. we already know there's a whiskey shortage. Rum. 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 I, beer. I'm going to say beer. So, meal. <laughs> <laughs> so he's uh, elbowing up to the bar, and Jamie goes over there and talks to him like any man would. What war were we in, bud? And then they bond over the fact that they were both in the Battle of Culloden. And so they can talk a little I bit more was freely. The lads. Yeah, I talk a little more freely with you. And he's like, why wouldn't you take this free land? And then Jamie finds out that the that Governor Tryon's tax collectors are corrupt. <laughs> and that they've been taking like horses and goods and stuff from all these settlers. And they're all very wary of an offer that seems too good to be true. And then Brian is like, if you want to know more, come to the meeting tonight. And we're like, what's this meeting? All right, another meeting. Great. <laughs> Great. Just what I need. More commitments. And then um, we're back to the Mueller cabin. And I know that this story goes somewhere else. But at this moment when there was a uh, uh, healthy baby and everybody seemed cool, I was like, please remain healthy, happy, and fertile all the way through about mm, 1952 or so, so that maybe you can give birth yep. to one Robert Mueller who will then, in a future timeline, possibly... Okay, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm backing out. Anyway, so they decide to name their baby Clara. Which is lovely. It's very sweet. And Claire is understandably honored and very touched. And then her grandfather pulls out the little doll he bought Check at the beginning. Off smallpox Check off smallpox doll. Check off smallpox doll. Pulls it out to hand it to the baby. And then yeah, and he, the baby's like, thanks, man. Thanks. It was great. What's up? Oh, that's this what is, I wanted. I like this. I mean, you're making a lot of assumptions about my gender, but, but it's fine. Whatever. It's cool. I'll play with it. Whatever. What else do I have to play with? Corn husks? No. Oh, hold on. Hold on. I just pooped. It's fine. <laughs> And then he looks out the window and, oh, no. It's savages, savages, savages. And it's really just some Cherokee dudes who want some water for their horses, but obviously Herr Muller can't deal with that, so. I, uh, I appreciate the way that they handled this storyline because mm-hmm. it just, it's fucking xenophobic panic. Right. Leading to total fucking disaster, as it so often does, when really the people just wanted some water right. for their horses. And as the unnamed Native American man says, that who's been in a couple of episodes now, but I don't think we've heard a name for him yet, so I'm mm-hmm. just going to say unnamed. Um, uh, water belongs to everyone, which is how it should be. Uh, Nestle begs uh, to differ. Uh, state of Michigan. <laughs> Nestle begs to differ. Yeah. Um, anyway, Gross. Patty. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, this is what happens when we say we have no quibbles with the episode. We find quibbles with <laughs> other <laughs> things. Well, but like quibbles with life, yeah. not necessarily quibbles with the episode. Yeah. So Mueller comes out with his gun and his sad little scared other son, nephew, who's son. the other kid. Yeah, and they both get their guns drawn and then How Claire. How do you say uncle in German? <gasps> uncle. <laughs> That was a nice moment. And then Claire has to come out and like bring everybody down. Come on, y'all. Put your bow and arrow down. Put your guns down. They just wanted water. It's okay. And then the Cherokee dude like sprinkles something on the ground. And that right freaks Herr Muller out. And he's like, oh, what the fuck was that? And Claire's like, it's just a blessing. It's just a blessing. Calm down. Calm down. He's blessing the water. He's blessing that this was a place where his horse was able to get water. Let's get back in the cabin. Get back in the cabin. And then we're um, back home to Fraser's Ridge with Claire, and it's a, it's Monton! 
gosh, she's doing some chores. Lots and lots of but chores. But first she comes in and is just like, oh, Ugh. and she Falls takes her bra bed. off. Yes. Yes. <laughs> it's like, it's, that's what it felt like. It totally, I mean, we didn't actually see her take her, but that's what happened. It, it's what right? it felt she like. She walked though. in and it was like, hold on just a second. And she takes off her petticoats and she puts on her comfy petticoats. It's, yes. And then she takes <laughs> off her, her, her breast bandage. Her brassiere. Brassiere. And then puts on nothing. Yeah. And then lays down on the bed. And then puts on six sweaters. And she, it, and it shows her on the bed. It shows her like feeding the horses, feeding Clarence, feeding the white sow, uh, going around tidying things up, like just kind of reminding you how hard this work was, and that she's alone for a few days and she's having to do it all herself. And there's some jaunty music, so it's like we feed things and we eat things and we dress <laughs> things and we dry things and we paint things and we sew things and we knit things and we. But do she's this and she's kind of tired. And we smoke this. And um, she does find some what appears to be not great alcohol because it smells bad. But at this point, bitch, don't care. She deserves a sip. She says she deserves a sip. So she settles down by the fire, takes a sip. Uh, and that's probably like day two, I'm going to yeah. say. Like, that's she what we're led to believe. She does not share with Rollo. No. Which seems like an oversight. He tries to eat something and she's like, piss off. And we're like, no, what? He's such a good boy. He's going to get everything he wants. Um, and then we're back to town. And it's Wien and Jamie talking about how this was an abject failure of a mission. And why the fuck couldn't we get anybody to do it? And Jamie's like, well, I guess I'm going to be on the hook for these taxes. I got to find some people. I want to protect them from having to pay taxes or getting their things stolen from them. But I guess, I, how am I going to pay taxes on 10,000 acres of land? Right. Mm-hmm. And they're about ready to leave. And then Wien discovers that the bit in their horse's mouth is broken. And it's like, oh, fuck, we can't even leave. And Jamie's like, hold up. There's a blacksmith right over there. Just get it done. I'm saying to you, get it done. Like he literally just says, however, get it done. however, you, how much, whatever you got. I don't do. care. I don't care what go, it costs. We got to do go. it. If you'll excuse me, I have to go talk to a comely young lady a hottie, about hot whether hot. or not her presumably unattractive husband is around. Mm-hmm. So he goes off with his candlestick. Mwah. Mwah. And then Ian goes into a blacksmith shop. And then you guys, hearts and rainbows. Let me tell you, it took Julie maybe 0.5 um, seconds. No, not true. <laughs> no, it was a little bit longer. Took, for, at first, I because, thought it was oh, Sam Neill. <laughs> well, she, she was just like, huh? Sam Elliott, I'm sorry. Just Sam watching and taking notes, and I'm just like, out of because I don't want to give it away. So I'm just like watching out of the corner of my eye. I'm just like staring at them, trying to see what's happening. And all I of a sudden, realized, she goes, <gasps> I know you can't see that, but I, you can hear what I just did with my upper body, right? <gasps> Is it? No. Yeah. No. Uh, uh, That's exactly what I did. Like, because I realized it was somebody important when they gave him the Bill Nye treatment, which is he gets to talk, but you don't see his face for like a hot minute. So they're waiting for him to turn around. Everybody. We get a hand shot, too. You have listened to this. You know who it is. Oh, God. Thank God. It's Marta. He's back. The Pample's back in town. The Pample's back in town. The Pample's back. The Pample's back. Speaking of Irish. So, Tin we're, we're very excited that Duncan LaCroix uh, is back because... God damn, he's, he's so very good. good. He's very good at his job of acting, and um, it was nice to see him. So he has this great scene with Ian where he's like, up closed, and Ian's like, boot, 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 and then he gives him like all his money, and he's like, all right, fine. And was it something about a phrase that he used that made... Murta reconsider when he said he'll have my something for garters. He'll have my, my uncle and my guts for garters. And no, I, I think it was just money. Yeah. Like he knew he had him over a barrel. So he was like, like all right, I'm fine. going home. And he says, not even for a fellow Scott. And Murta's He's like, like, I'll never go dude, home. If I would never leave if I only did things for Scott's. Do you have any idea where we are? Mm-hmm. It's North Carolina. <laughs> and so we in gets it done. It's 15 pounds Extra, not just yeah. 15 shillings, 15 whatever it is. Extra. And Jamie is like, not on tonight. <laughs> Wait, that's later though. Okay. Because it cuts in with the hot to thought scene with Gal in the doorway. My husband's still not home. Wink, wink. Want to come in and bring your candlestick? Whoop, 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 whoop. And he's like, mm, got a wife at home. She's probably waiting for me. And then she says something kind of presumably shady, which is like, I, I bet, bet she's she a good cook. cook. And like, what does that mean? And he goes, her vagina is fantastic. Test dates very hot. <laughs> Cooks me right up. Fills me right up. Could you say that? I don't know. 
And then I'm, we're, I think maybe, do you think it's, I bet she's a good cook is like, she's not as hot as I am. Yeah. I think that's what it is. And he's like, you have no idea. She's a decent cook, but she's a great lay. (laughs) Um, so we see that and then he comes back and Ian's there waiting for him and Ian's like, oh, got it done. God, that guy was an asshole. It cost so much money. Jamie's like, how much in true Scott style? And Ian's like, this much. And he's like, no way. And then he goes in there to fight him. And I'm like, yes, yes, he yes. He's mad. Yes, yes, yes. And he's like, oh, I can't believe you charged this much for the do. And you see... um, Murtaugh's face go from mad when the person first starts screaming again. By the way, his back is still turned in true Bill Nye entrance style, but they show him from to his like, face to like, to oh my God. A ghost. He just, he freezes so good. under that beautiful mop of white hair. And just above those ruddy, ruddy Can cheeks. we talk about that wig? Is this why Claire's hairlines have been so occasionally kind of dicey? Because they spent all of their wig budget on it's Marta's pretty good. wig. I think his is better than hers. Oh, no. I'm yeah. saying I think it's great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Looks very real. And I would run my fingers through it ad nauseum. Yes. And I love the salt and pepper of his beard is that there's still yeah. a little pepper right oh. at the back. They did a really good job with his hair in general. He looks great. And... Uh, I, two things. He looks great from a critical standpoint. He looks <laughs> like it is a good rendition He's of the aged character. Correctly, right? I do have to say that maybe the rouge is a little it's bit. It's a little too much. much. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be thinking that's exposure to the elements, or maybe he has a drinking problem, or if he's just drinking ruddy problem. fit. Maybe it's rosacea. I don't know. Whatever. Critically speaking, hmm, very excellent hair work and costuming. And then, the, then like the, lizard so brain. Yeah, my id. <laughs> I was like, God, I'd do it. Put it in me. (laughs) Ah, Smithy. So he turns around and Jamie realizes who he is. And this might be in my top five favorite Sam Hewen moments. Because he It's up there with fucking print shop. He really sells it. And it's beautiful. And I started crying. I'm not even ashamed to admit it. I had already seen it. I started crying. It was so well done. And you know why? Because... Duncan LaCroix was there. Oh. <laughs> it was a beautiful reunion scene. They see each other. They're just so happy that the other person is alive. There's going to be lots of catching up to do and everything. And Ian all of a sudden realizes, oh, my God, this is my you uncle's god. this old coot. coot. Yeah, the whole old coot thing is hilarious. So they have this lovely, beautiful scene. And it's so. And Sam is very good at the, like, I'm so happy, but also my eyes are filled with tears. Right. And... There's this it's very so simple moment where Murta just says, thank God, when he realizes that Jamie's alive. It's all beautiful. And then at the end of it, that sly motherfucker, that crafty bastard, turns to Wean and goes, now who are you calling an no old coot? coot? And it is just Perfect. delicious. So we're all oh. thrilled. I just like... Thrilled. Don't want that scene to end. Ever. No, it was it was it's the best scene going of season four so in far. My in heart. my mind. That was the best scene so far of this season, without a doubt. And thank you, Duncan Mm LaCroix. So uh, I do have a note here that says, I'm not crying, you're crying, and I know you all did. And then we find out, back at the homestead, Claire's alone, just digging around in whiskey and knitting, whatever the fuck she's doing. And the pastor dude, Father Glockenspiel, is that what you called him? <laughs> yeah. Father Glockenspiel. Father, <laughs> he's very German. Father Lederhosen. I'm going to assume that they are Lutheran. I'm not going to. I, f- yep. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. So he comes banging on her door and she's freaked out, right? She's already nervous because she had that. Yeah. She had that um, standoff at the creek. Yeah. Well, also remember that one time she found a fucking skull and then a ghost showed her to her new home. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But he did show her to Fraser's Ridge. So. Fraser's Ridge. <laughs> so um, the father tells her, holy shit, Claire, you better be careful. You in danger. Because uh, Herr Muller has gone nutso. The daughter and the baby both died of the measles. And he believes that the Cherokee cursed them when they sprinkled whatever on the water. And Claire's like, it wasn't a curse. It was a blessing. And Father Glockenspiel's like, whatever, man, got to go away. And he runs away. Well, in his defense, he's like, you should leave. She's like, no, I have a gun. And he's like, Ugh. Okay. Okay. Bye. No. 
and he leaves, and then it's clear another montage getting ready for a fight. Stuffing her gun, making sure that powder's dry, getting by the fire, making sure Rollo's fed. Yeah, and making up with Rollo, being right. like, I'm really sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, cool. I'm sorry, cool. sorry, snack, snack, snack. Please be cool. <laughs> And then we're back to Murtaugh, and it's Murtaugh, Wien, and Jamie in a uh, I think pub. in the same bar. Yeah, same one. Uh, there's probably only one, I would guess, in this town, right? Are they in Cross Creek? Cross Creek. And he's tell it, it, it feels like he's been telling his story because Wien's coming back with another three beers, and Wien's like, it must have been awful to be indentured for so long. Was it just terrible? And Murtaugh's like, yeah, uh, it fucking yeah. sucked. I'm sorry. Did you just ask me if being indentured was terrible? Mm, God, fucking kids. Yeah, kids. Have an avocado toast, Ian. (laughs) Why don't you just go ruin marriage? (laughs) So uh, we get a little bit of chat, and Jamie starts giving Murtaugh the hard press, like, why don't you come to Fraser's Ridge with us? Why We need your skills. You can come out there. You can help us do the settlement. I should say, it does seem like he sort of assumes that he's going to go. Yeah, which... I also assumed he was going to go. I kind of assumed it, but then when... Ooh, because That was my computer. Sorry. Because Duncan LaCroix is so good when that <laughs> moment his eyes flutter just a little bit. Amanda just said, bunny, brie, bunny, brie. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Duncan LaCroix's eyes flutter just like a little bit, and it's like, I got my own shit, dude. I, like, I live here. I live here. I have an entire blacksmith shop. I can't just, like, pick up and leave. Ah. Also, uh, do you fuck it? Are you... And you're with Governor Trine? Come on. Like, are you even politically aware? Yeah. Come I on. Mean, get it together. Jesus. And uh, so it's, it seems like Murtaugh is not going to go to Fraser's Ridge. And then he says, if you want to know more... Come to a meeting tonight, and we're led to believe it's the same meeting that Brian told him about earlier, and indeed it is. We'll get there. Cut back to Claire alone at the cabin at night. It's a stormy night. Maybe this explains the fire thing. Did it rain? Maybe the Cherokee aren't so nervous about the forest. Because remember, it was stormy, kind of, so maybe it was wet already. I don't know. That's That's a reach. That's a fucking reach. But what is not a reach is that Claire is fucking terrified because she is alone in a cabin in the middle of the fucking woods, just her, a beautiful dog, and a shotgun. And that puts her two up, but still not great. And the, in Claire's defense, the beautiful dog does look a lot like a beautiful wolf mm-hmm. and could, like, cut you with his beautiful teeth. Oh, yeah, he can hurt you. Yeah. Um, so she's she's scared, and it's very scared. And... um. Allison's like, Rollo's cute. And I was like, that dog is beyond cute. And also, once again, may I remind you, Netflix dogs, episode three. All right. And then we go back to the meeting that both Brian and Murtaugh were talking about. And it is a uh, rabble rousing meeting of all the Scotsmen in town. Everybody's there and they've all got beers and they're all, it's like fidgety and angry. It's very angry, menace. And then it's time for the meeting to start. And who starts the fucking meeting? Who? Who? Marta. Oh, he is their leader. There's this, the previous week's episode of Doctor Who, there's a moment when, um, and it happens twice, both the doctor and her male companion, who the King of England assumes is the leader of the team because he's of a, a dude, right? Um, both say, it's a very flat team structure. And that is basically what Marta says when, when we and is like, and you're the leader. He basically goes, it's a very flat team structure. <laughs> but yeah, he's he like... T- he like set, he takes a moment. He's very dramatic. He, he is. like sets it up. He's like, I like today's a toast. Here <laughs> is me setting you up to think that I'm gonna make you mad, and instead I'm gonna make you mad in a good way. <laughs> and then everyone, yeah, yes, men are easy to manipulate. <laughs> And so, I mean, Julie, I mean, we watch Outlander. I know women are easy to manipulate too. I mean, I would say that men were easier, just this much well, easier. Well, it depends. I mean, they've got so many hardcore strictures that they feel like they have to live up to that it's really easy to like manipulate them within those strictures. Sure, but also long distance commercials. Yeah, uh, you know what. <laughs> For me, it's not the long distance commercials. It's the Orbit gum one where the little girl has all the little origami swans that her one. dad made from the gum wrappers. God and then damn he realizes it. she's taking them to college. Oh my God. Yeah, it's a good one. Because the shoebox opens and they fall in. You know, oh and then his shriveled little <laughs> legs. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or, or, this is the best part. <laughs> and she, she saw the painting. She saw the painting. And it's, oh, oh, and it just, and they kiss. And they, no, no. 
Oh my God. It's true. We're easy to manipulate as well. They already manipulated me in this episode, but I would like to believe that they also manipulated a few dudes. Well, you know, and being manipulated is a part of good art. It's just that sometimes it's also a part of shitty art. Dogs episode three, not shitty, but perfect manipulation. So... We find out that uh, Papal Moose is trying to get everybody on the same side to fight back against the tax collectors. Yeah, like saying we're, basically like, we're going to pay our taxes. Tomorrow. We're going to pay our taxes, but we're not going to give them any more than our taxes. And we mm-hmm. all have to stand together. It's like basically Sally Field and Norma Ray. Mm-hmm. Um, Very Norma Ray. And then, Very Bill Pullman in Independence Day. Yes. They can take our... We're going to live we're, on. We're going to survive. Today we celebrate, celebrate our Independence Day. Day. I think you were... I was about to do Braveheart. William, well, I Wallace, was about yeah. to do Braveheart. They may take our Galactus. taxes, but they'll they never take, take our additional taxes. <laughs> <laughs> they'll never take our horses and cows. <laughs> like <laughs> They may take our taxes, but they will not take our fight for pigs. <laughs> All right, and then we cut back to Claire in the cabin, and here comes Sarah Muller, and we're all like, huh, and she's got her shotgun out, and she's ready, and Rollo is there at the ready, too, but Hera Muller seems very sad and chastened, and just kind of the fight is out of him. He shows up to find out that whether or not she's okay. Whether or not she's got the measles, right? The measles! So, the measles. So she comes in and sits, he comes in and sits down, and they have this whole conversation where we just find out that there was no way he was ever going to believe that this was anything other than the Native Americans' fault because they, quote, don't believe in God. This isn't supposed to happen to us. We believe in God. Yeah. It's gross. So instead of believing Claire, who's actually trying to tell him how sickness works, he believes some kind of fantasy or idea that he's made up for himself about how the Native Americans could never not be the fault of this because they are not godly. It's almost like some people would prefer to believe whatever narrative makes them feel better about the bad things in their lives as opposed to science and truth. It's almost like that. It's almost like that. It's almost like that. It's yeah. very close to that. So anyway, more about global warming. Um, <laughs> so it's weird oh and God, clear. I'm so old. My hip just popped and I'm sitting. Oh, no. Mine, mine pops in bed. <laughs> I, know. I bet it pops in bed. <laughs> okay. So Janine is going to be so ashamed of us. We're taking way too long. We're getting there. So Claire feels bad for him. He goes on a bit. You can tell he's just xenophobic asshole but also he's lost almost everything he's scared but it's not any reason for him to be this person anyway he gives her it wrapped in the gingham that the smallpox quote-unquote doll at the beginning was wrapped in that's what claire thinks it is he thinks he is handing her the baby's doll nope nope it is once again what is her name i'm terribly shitty at that Adewene. Adewene's scalp. I think that's right. I want to believe, like Fox Mulder, that it is somebody else's and she just thinks it hers. But it feels like no, there, was an identifying, well, there was an identifying sees, streak in it. No, um, the, it was like a, like a belt or mm-hmm. like a chain of beads that's mm-hmm. also in there. They show it like a real quick flash. Yeah. So, yeah. No, so it's, it's, I mean, it's definitely her. That happens okay. in the books. So too. he killed her and he's like, she's a witch, no witch, no curse. And it's like, oh, you don't know shit about witches. <laughs> <laughs> um, so she... Claire is obviously very disgusted, distraught, and very upset and sad, and she just tells him to leave. Goodbye, Heath. See ya. So he leaves, and then um, she... Does it all happen as a montage together? I don't remember exactly how this happens. Does he just go back to the cabin, and we see the Cherokee... Somewhere, I'm not arrows. sure in the order in which it happens, but yeah, we see the Cherokee, they show up and they shoot flaming arrows into both the roof and through the windows of this cabin. One of them hits uh, 
Mrs. Frau Mueller, Mueller. Frau Mueller, who walks. It's pretty creepy, honestly. Mm-hmm. She walks out, and then all of a sudden you realize like her back is on fire, and then she kind of like trots down the steps and then just falls flat on her face. And you As see this he rides up, sees his house on fire, sees his wife burning to death in the front yard. He flips out and loses his shit, stands up, and of course they're ready for him, and he gets two arrows to the back, and he's dead now too. So terrible. Yeah. But also, um, I mean, he fucking murdered an, their old, matriarch. an old woman. Yeah. Um, How did he get to her? That's a question, too. Does that happen in the books? Do you get to see the story of how he... No, but he... Um, I think in the in the books, it's um, that it's basically just like... He, first of all, he kills more than one person. It's, okay. Um, the woman and her, I think, her daughter-in-law. Mm-hmm. Um, because he finds them. Like, he just stumbles on them. And they're the first native people he meets. And so he just kills and them. And he kills them and brings their scalps to Claire. Great. It's uh, terrible. It is horrible. Um, here is a thing. <laughs> this is both in the books. And I don't know why I snorted. <laughs> you did snort. Just now. In the books. <laughs> and um, in the show, when he, when she meets Adewene, um, she, the daughter-in-law translates and says, you know, like when you, she had a dream about you and you turned into a white raven and you flew into the moon and this, that, and the other thing. And you have some magic now you will have more when your hair is white, whatever. The last thing she says is she wants you to know it won't be your fault. Ooh. Yeah. So that's what that is. Am I going to cry again? That'll be like the fifth time I've cried today. It's a good, I, you I'm guys, up. it's a good, Netflix dog season three, Murtaugh's <laughs> return. I've had too much today. Just too much. Yeah. So she's also on her third beer. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, so then as everything burns down, what do we see? Allison sitting up weirdly of its own design. The smallpox uh, doll on mustache. Fire. Just mustache. Coincidentally, the smallpox doll has a large mustache. <laughs> Whatever, it's fine. It's too but we, much. But it was too but like much. we already get it. Like and why? Maybe you wouldn't get it if it wasn't the title card, but because it's the title card, mm-hmm. we don't fucking need to know that it's the doll, right? Like we already know because it was in the title card. So like we already know. You yeah. don't need to pushy, anyway, pushy, whatever. Pushy. Um it's uh yeah. And then we <laughs> cut to the present. I mean, the past for us, but the present of, of the show, whatever, the 60s, 70s. And Roger's Roger reading letter. is reading the letter, and it's voiceover from Bree saying, "I, you always told me, I found out that something terrible happened to my parents. I have to go back and try to stop it. I think it. we skipped something, because this is what how the episode skip? ends. We skipped, um, so Jamie comes back to oh, the ridge. Oh, yes. And they yes. hug, and they cry, and she says, just hold me. Right. And she's very upset, and she and has these yes. fabulous wrist warmers on. But also her uh, Chef, yeah, and her chef. It's kind of hot. It's very nice. It's and very then, homestead hot, right? She bounces back, and she's out doing more chores because homesteading is like nonstop chores, ninety nine percent of the time. Um, so she's like splitting wood or something, and all of a sudden she hears a whistle. She understandably is like, "Fuck, where's my large rifle and my adorable dog?" And then she realizes the person is whistling fucking boogie woogie bugle boy. It's fucking Murta. Murta, who I don't know if we said this, who decided to not come back. Did we say mm-hmm, he decided to not mm-hmm. come back? Okay, so. It's fucking Murta, and they see each other, and she says, Murta, is it really you? And he says, it's not the, the boogie, boogie woogie bugle, bugle boy. <laughs> and it's Which I was a little bit like, mm, oh, I love but it. But it was cute. It's a nice throwback. Well, I like that it's acknowledging that they have their own, their own relationship. relationship right. Yeah. Um, and they hug, and it's very, and you see Murta's horse tied up in the back and they hug and it's very nice and she invites him in and it's very nice yeah and then roger's reading the letter right roger and his 97 layers of clothing <laughs> yep. he's, he's just very knitted up he's uh got rosy cheeks and but from the neck down covered in sweat yes oh god it's very oh, I know damp that feeling. There. yep uh, and so he's reading it and it's a voiceover from Breeze saying, I found out that something horrible happened to my parents. I have to go back and try to save them. You once told me to keep my mother as a fond memory. And I hope that you feel that way about me. Don't come after me. Don't come after me, brah. We all know that that means he's coming after her, trying sure. to her, trying to find her whatever. So 
the last moment we see is Bree at Craig Nadine about to touch the King Dick Rock. She's got on kind of homespun, like 70s, like she tried to find the I like it. dresses at stores that looked... No, it's perfect because it's like she tried to buy it off the rack. Except for her fry boots. Like, she's going to get... She's, <laughs> well, I told you about the dresses that... The dress that, Claire's, that Claire wears in the books. Mm-hmm. Um, Brie also buys one of those, but the only one big enough to fit her because in the book, she's like six feet tall mm-hmm. and like built Bigger. like Jamie Fraser, yeah. right? She's like very solid girl. Um, the only one that was big enough to fit her is like fucking lime green. <laughs> so it's a lime green, like wench dress. Yeah. And here it's just like a bunch of layers. All It's that weird. She like, looks cute is what she looks. It's that weird seventies brown and orange kind of homestead farming thing that happened after. With some uh, sick boots. After, uh, l- um, uh, what's the prairie? Come on. Little House on little the House Prairie? Little House on the Prairie came Laura out where all of a sudden all that shit with like the little ruffles and the little bows. It's very clear that she just went and bought this. Maybe she made the cloak. Maybe. Maybe. But the boots are going to give her away hard. <laughs> so she touches the rock and then it comes around and <gasps> no more Brianna. No, it's okay. a nice, it goes mm-hmm. and like swirls around. So we have to assume that Brianna has... Touched the dick rock and gone back. Now, here's my question. Yes, Julie. Is the dick rock always a conduit between two specific years? Like this year and this oh, many you years know in what? the past? We'll do an in the book section and I will get into this because this is a, in, a good question that you ask. Yeah. And there are answers, but they're a little spoilery. Okay. So I will do it in an in the books slash je suis spoiler okay. that we'll do after our thing. Okay. Um, let's do some scales. Okay. All right. Uh, well, let's do, let's do the very easy one first. Yeah. All right. The golden pample moose. <laughs> the golden pample moose. The, that's it. The ivory pample moose. It's just even... <laughs> no, the silver pample moose. The silver pample moose. <laughs> well, that makes it sound like second place. Oh, no. First in my heart. Yeah, always. Yeah. The platinum pample moose. <gasps> oh, yeah. That's the, it. What's the fucking vibranium? The vibranium. No, what's the shit in d Titanium. D&D? What's above? Electrum? Electrum. <laughs> the electrum, electrum pample moose. moose. Whatever. It's the pristine pample moose. It's him. That's it. Oh, Fuck it. He, he's so he good. He brought back a layer of not not just gravitas, but also just kind of getting me back into the scene work that I thought was very important. It's yeah. been it's been since Lord John. It's been since uh, uh, it's been since then that I have felt that invested in the acting of this show. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. I think that there are some good scenes, but they're not like this one. This yeah. one is like... Well, and I think part of that is the history, yeah. right? Like, a, there's a lot of subtext. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the writing this season has been super Lacking text, it, right? right? Mm-hmm. Like, because it, it's all immediate needs and it's mm-hmm. place setting, whatever. This was all about history. It was beautiful. Which is why we have to go to fucking... Left. Tenet. Leonard. By the way, I want you to know that for the Portland Trailblazers, I've decided that since there's no more... Now there's only... Leonard. Whenever he does something good or bad, it's just Leonard. Leonard. <laughs> He's real dopey looking. He is real dopey looking, but so was Plumley. <laughs> yeah, Plumley. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So scales. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're just gonna skip the doing it. Scale there was none because so. it's, it's really just about how I would like to wrap my hands in some ivory wig and just go nuts. Just do it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right. So costumes. Hmm. Ooh, these were really good costumes. I have been, for the last couple of episodes, just entranced by the Native American costumes. Beautiful, right? You don't so see layered. them. Right, but you don't see them a lot. You just see a little bit at a time because their scenes are so short. But the detail that is there is obvious even in those brief glimpses. And if you were given just a full scene of just the warriors themselves, like the, with the Western clothing adorned with their own native touches and everything, it's just so incredible. And I had a question about this earlier. I was thinking about it. I mean, 
I'm not of that culture. I don't understand anything about it, but I feel like if you go back to their own tradition, there is a definite tradition of adornment, not just for the women, but for the men, Mm -hmm. not just like jewelry and stuff, but hair and, and just really cool stuff. Every depiction of them I've ever seen, either fictional or like in photographs, Mm -hmm. um, or video, you know what I mean? I've never spent time. I've never been in a situation where I was spending time with native people who were, um, in any way, like in regalia right or however you would put it but it's so it's interesting to see from my perspective how they would take things that they gleaned like you know after a battle or after a, a sortie or whatever like i got a jacket or i got this or i got this and then how it weirdly just seamlessly works into the rest of the way that they dress it's anyway, I think it's really cool and very well done. Yeah. Really well done. Beautiful. And, um, not stereotypical. And I still not think, like in your, not in your, she's yes. not pushing it in your face. It just is. It's just the way that they are. It's not a bunch of people walking around like in loincloths naked from the waist up right. with like full elaborate paint. paint. Like yeah. th- there no. is that, but it's there, not the it's same. It's beautiful, but it's also practical. Right. And it's, it's their daily dress. Yes. It's not um, like some kind of ritualistic or battle wear. It's just the way that it's a Monday. It's Tuesday. Yeah. And it's just cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't know what to do for a scale for this one. I'm just going to agree with you. I'll say this. I also think the, Costuming. Well, I threw well, out for. I want to the, the rabbit been, shrug though, oh, y'all. That, that shrug. was hot. There's been some chatter on the Slack about how dopey uh, Roger looks, and uh, we had a question. I gotta from say, Heather. the hat was just a little bit too large. It was, but you know what? Here's He's the cold. thing. Here's what what Heather J had to say. I've all I've heard Roger was described as kind of rugged and dashing in the books. Is that true? Because this week especially, yeesh, Roger Rankin is a fine looking man, and they don't seem to be doing him any favors. But here's the thing, Heather and everyone. I I agree. He looks very frumpy, but he's a fucking history professor at Oxford. He is a frump. He is, and he is cold and tired. And he just wants to be fucking warm in Inverness, man. So he's got a turtleneck, button-down, corduroy jacket, coat, scarf, gloves, ill-fitting pants, practical footwear, and a hat that he probably borrowed from his landlady. It's like Chicago in February. Totally. Where it's like... We talked about this. I know these scarves don't match. I don't... I I look horrible. I don't give a fuck. That's all right. I give a fuck about how my ass feels. My ass feels warm. warm. I need to be warm and I need to be dry. So I did think the hat was a little goofy, but the rest of it, whatever. Also, that guy's a stone cold fox. And I know they're trying their best to frump him up. Yeah. Right. No, he's a stone cold fox. All right. Costumes. I don't know. Maybe I could come up with a scale. Oh, do it. Let me see. So since we have depictions of Native Americans here, I'm trying to think of something. uh, But that's not what the costumes are about. The costumes are about just daily life, not only for the Native yeah. Americans, but also for the yes, colonizers. Layers, practicality. Layers, practicality. Okay, here's one. I don't know if this would be the top or the bottom. You tell me, Allison, okay. as the film critic. <laughs> what was the name of the movie with Clive Owen where in a, in a country of men? In a Children of Men. Children of Men. God, that's a good movie. Okay, so that one was a very interesting film because it's post now. It's in the future. It's in a dystopian future where women are infertile mostly and they're trying to figure out how to keep the human race going. So everything is inherently very practical, Mm -hmm. but it's also very bleak. So there's that. Did you see A Quiet Place? No, I did not. That's the one with John Krasinski. And- that is a similar thing that would be really good for the high end, where the costuming is so good for that movie because it's all telling the story through the fact that they're all wearing clothes that don't match. Like many pieces of clothing, none of them match. Mm-hmm. All of them practical. Mm-hmm. But it's like different seasons, different uses, um, lots of sweaters, lots of hats, just like, Obviously, shit they scavenged. Okay. Could not more obviously be shit they scavenged. That's interesting. It's, they're really good costumes. Okay, and so we the got those two. End, the, so those would be the high end. So the low end would have to be something like 
fucking some John Wayne Western with Native Americans in it where it's nothing but... Ooh, what about the fucking Mary Martin Peter Pan? Oh, yeah. Because yes. you know what? Those also aren't practical clothes for flying. No, they are not. Yes. Great. Okay, so I'm going to give this episode Dances with Wolves. Ooh! Because it's daily for him and daily for her. Yep. Great. Yeah, okay. Good. All right. Uh, we're skipping the sex. Yeah. So then it's... Uh, how often would you get up to get a beer? I wouldn't. And and that's even not knowing. So let's do a scale of, the, here's the scale. The scale is of um, Ken Duncan LaCroix isn't, uh, yeah, Ken Burns, Duncan LaCroix isn't an outlander anymore. And Duncan LaCroix comes back to outlander. Well, I wasn't, I had no idea that this was coming. And <laughs> that is to your credit that you did not spoil that for me well, or that the internet didn't fucking spoil it for me based on the amount of time I spend on our Slack channel and all this shit. You People guys, been, good job. you have been Slack friends. You've been very good about confining show discussion to the spoilers channel, which I never look at. Thank you so much. Well, now you can, right? Like, but because the, I like that. I don't because then I, I don't know. No, but that's where they discuss the current episode. So oh, you okay. can go in there now and you'd be fine. there would just be like, they'll be talking about the next week on the most recent thing in the spoiler channel let's check is uh jenna huntsberger talking about not knowing if she'll ever like the way they treat the native american storylines but really like the rest of the episode i started squealing before murta even turned around and alex was staring at me like i'd lost my mind (laughs) (laughs) i feel you um i'm gonna give this one Oh, come on. You're going to give it up. Murtaugh's back on Outlander. I'm going to give it a Murtaugh's back on Outlander, but the thing is, the episode started, I didn't know that. Yeah. And even still, I was... Ooh, good point. I was into this episode more than I have been into some of the past episodes. Let me ask you this. Are you going to give it a those coats? Oh, it could almost be a those coats. The thing is... There, Cor- a I corpse had punch? I had not a corpse punch. I had quibbles... But my quibbles were kind of what was keeping me there. Like, yes, this cabin is too well appointed, but can I please look at all the shit in the cabin? Like <laughs> that. So I wasn't going to get up and leave. And then when Marta showed up, I definitely wasn't going to get up and leave. So I would say that this one was eminently watchable. Not a lot of time to pause and reflect. Just go. Yeah. This one was the best one of this season so far, I think without a doubt. I think it's like... Stealing the cotter pins. Don't get up and leave. Yeah. Yeah. It's like there. Because it's not Unless like you a have finale. to get up and walk away because you have to fucking shake it out. <laughs> I almost got out our fans today and I did not. I, we, that would have been a good time for um, them. Yeah. I'm going to agree with you. Mm-hmm. I might give it a corpse punch. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't give it a... I closed my eyes and thought of England. Like I wouldn't give it a faith. Mm-hmm. But I might give it a corpse punch. Mm-hmm. I might give it a... I don't know. This is a very good episode. It's the best episode in at least mm, It's the best seven episode episodes? of the season, and it's the best since, like, mid-season three. three. Yeah. Then mm-hmm. there have been there were very good things individually in but the back episode half of wise, season three. They weren't as cohesive. Yes. This episode is very cohesive. Yeah. It feels like two very well-told stories as opposed to skipping around between like 20 things. I don't, it just felt more focused. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to believe it is because Duncan LaCroix returned because they knew they had to devote enough time to that story. And not only that in the writer's room, but also because we have Duncan LaCroix back. So we get to see that kind of acting again. It's just good. So I also want to talk about the role he's going to play on the show going forward. We will also keep that to just we show spoilers. Spoilers. Uh, But for right now, we want to thank everybody for listening. Uh, If you want to chat with us, you can find us on Twitter at PodlanderCast. You can find us on Facebook at Facebook.com slash PodlanderCast. You can find us on Patreon at Patreon.com slash PodlanderDrunkCast, where you can read things and listen to things. Everybody gets the episode early, and we are, like, past due for a bonus episode. Maybe we should do one of those next week. We can talk about movies. Or we can do one of our backlogs. Both. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, Patty. That's what they're called. You can do it anyway, Patty. Um, anyway, Patty. Uh, you can also, from time to time, watch us live stream our watching of the episode. Anybody who did that today got to watch Julie silently react with pure, unadulterated joy <laughs> when Murta showed up. It's true. 
There was and then no I cried. way. And we then I cried. You one. guys all fucking watched me cry. It was good. Um, Dogs episode uh, three. We want to thank all of our patrons because they're all amazing, but especially, and for some reason, I never, oh, I know exactly why I navigated away. Somebody messaged me and yes. said, uh, hey, you're pronouncing my name wrong. And I said, great, I'm going to adjust that. And now I can't remember who it was. Is it <laughs> so, Jonna or? Uh, it is not Jonna. Uh, if T- I Tanya? S- it's not Tanya. If I say your name wrong, um, just send me one more message and I won't have it again. But maybe I... Also, I'm just doing it right now. Anyway, we want to thank all of our patrons, but especially... <laughs> Trish McCrary, Jen Lander Drunklin, Jenna Polkowski, Dr. J, Lori McGuire, Ann Gavin, Katie Kirshner, Amanda Newton, Beth Locke, Mary Lumpkin, Tanner Cole, Kiki, The, the Wise. Wise, Tara Lucchino, Crystal Nanavati, Ann Gibson, Anna, Ida with an I, Aaron Yitzi, Molly Layton, Heather Moore, Ruth McCormick, Kara Marlowe, Flourish Root, Friday Payton, Viv Pickles, and Kathleen Moniz. Hi, Hi Mom. Mom. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, we will be back next week to to talk about uh, the return of the coin face, mm-hmm. which I am very excited about, and we're gonna do a just we spoiler. So if you don't want to know shit about the books, then stop listening now. Bye. bye. Don't stop the thing though, Julie. I won't though. Bye. Bye. That's for me to edit. Bye. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so. What was the other in the books thing? Oh, the time travel. Yes. Mm. So, so is it between separate, ye- like it's always got to be this many years apart at these times? Like how does it work? Well, so we know that they can travel on like solstices essentially, right? Okay. Like That's right. Cause she was like Halloween or Samhain or whatever it was the first time. Or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, Galus has a theory that I don't remember whether or not we see it in her notebook. In her grimoire. Grimoire. Um, in her witch book, <laughs> or maybe this one isn't Galus and Claire. I don't know. Whatever. There is a theory that you are pointed by a person and that the reason Claire landed in the time she did is because she was thinking about Frank. So she landed where Blackjack was. Oh my God. Yeah. So then when she went back, it she was, was Jamie. Jamie. Mm-hmm. So then Brianna would be thinking about Claire. Mm-hmm. Roger would be thinking about. Brianna. Okay. But so Brianna goes to the stones at Craig Nadoon, touches a dick rock thinking about her mom. It doesn't just spit her out at Craig Nadoon on the other side. It, it takes does. her no, to No, it's always geographically the same. Okay. Yes. But it's about the time, time. is about the person. Exactly. Okay. Um then what the fuck were the Loch Ness monsters thinking about? Or did they just swim through it not knowing? Like, boop, boop, boop. yeah, I mean, I think then it's probably for, uh, I mean, it could be DNA. Who fucking knows? Mm-hmm. Um, um, dino DNA. Dino DNA. <laughs> uh, but it could also, it could also just be, I mean, it, it, there's nothing to say that you can't travel in time when there isn't somebody, mm-hmm. right? Um, but it's like, I don't know. The whose m- was Lodestone or something? Whose was. Galus is presumably Bonnie Prince Charlie. Ah, right, right, because she was trying to go for the independent Scotland thing. Yeah. Okay. Presumably, and this is if you really don't want to know book shit, you got to tap out now because this is a big thing, and tap I'm not going to spoil too much for you. I but I worried. will say that this theory is proven at least somewhat true because at at some point, not this season, somebody goes through and ends up in the wrong time. I've been waiting for that to happen and the whole it's time because this person has a, a a parent who went missing early in their life. Mm-hmm. Um, turns out that they inadvertently went through the stones in an airplane, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, and when this person goes through the stones, they aren't thinking about the person they're looking for; they're thinking about their absent parent, right? And they end up. It ends up being like. I don't know, 20 years before. Mm-hmm. Um, so then he ends up in the wrong time. Okay. okay. Oh, I said he, but it has to redo what it. Is? Um, so yeah, so there's the gemstone thing and there's the person thing. And there's a, one of Galus's theories is that it's easier for women than men, but spoiler, Roger makes it through. Okay. And then there's another spoiler that you got to set a bitch on fire. <laughs> like, 
<laughs> you got to kill a spouse. Galus, she thought she had to kill her spouse to do there it. There needed to be a sacrifice, but it would seem that Galus is wrong mm-hmm. because Claire has. I mean, it does seem like incredibly painful, um, but uh, Claire doesn't have a problem going through without straight up murdering someone. Yeah. So. Uh, <laughs> So like gangster, Gayless, you probably didn't need to fucking murder <laughs> probably those people. Probably didn't need that. You probably didn't need that. Um, you could have gone through just fine without kidnapping Ian, and then you'd still be alive, bitch. Damn. Like what? Uh, what was the other book thing we were going to talk about? It was a thing just now. Was it about Murta? Was it about? Oh, I wanted to talk about yeah. So Murta. So the person that oh, I guessed early on he was coming back as somebody was else. Duncan Innes, who and I'm spoiling a thing for Julie here. Don't care. Um, who is an Ardsmere prisoner uh, who loses an arm, um, and settles with Jamie and is his. <laughs> Right, right hand man. Oh, God. Going to hell for that. I mean, he is, though. Uh, he ultimately ends up marrying Jocasta. I kind of figured that the way you talked about it. Yeah. Um, and then has his own complicated storyline. And I just assumed that that's where Murta was going to go. That we would, when we found him again in America, he'd be missing an arm. And then he married Jocasta and he'd get that whole storyline because we didn't meet Duncan Innes. Do you think that the way that this is being treated precludes the fact that he will meet Jocasta and marry her? I think it does not, but it is unlikely. It seems unlikely to me that Jocasta being very um, politically savvy would marry someone who was a regulator. Yeah. Okay. That seems unlikely to me. So there are some other regulators that we meet, um, because that's a whole big storyline. One of them is a Quaker named Herman Husband, who is like a very outspoken leader of the regulators whose mind is eventually turned in this battle that happens. Um, Murtaugh is obviously not a Quaker, but it is possible that he could be that standing in for that. Um, and then the others are far less um, well drawn. So okay. if he was taking another, but also in my interview with Diana Gabaldon, which but that's we should play that. Well, patrons have heard it. Okay, um, so that one just needs to go on iTunes. Okay, um, but patrons who have heard it and people who will hear it in the future. One of the things she said is that Murta ends up being sort of a combination of two characters. So mm-hmm. it is possible that the other one is Duncan Innes. There are mm-hmm. other characters that they meet who end up settling on the ridge and doing all kinds of things. So who knows? Mm. Um, I don't fucking care. He's back. That's got, all that matters God. to me. Thank God. He's just such a good actor. And I'm glad that an actor like him found this. They found a good gig, steady money. He is, hilariously, he's also in The Outlaw King on Netflix, which is not a good movie. Okay. Um, Daddy is also in that. Neither of them has very big parts. Mm-hmm. Um but he plays, he's on the side, he's on the side of the English. Um, he's got that accent and his British accent is very good. Mm-hmm. But I was like, but do you, he's like real Scottish. Also, he has a very unattractive bowl cut. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't do that to him. I know. Whatever. He made money. Take that Netflix yes, money. Yes, you're right. Duncan. Take that Netflix money. I'm, I have no power. But like with my very tiny, tiny, tiny platform, this tiny microphone on my dining room table, all I want, I meant just like in general, like mm-hmm. with what I'm doing with my career at the moment. Right. All I want to do is tell people to hire Duncan Lacroix. <laughs> just like hire, put him in everything. Just put him in as a silent Jesus guy Christ. in the background that just has one bring moment with a close up. Demon That's on it. the good place. Just it. That's it. Just bring him. He could play a demon on the good place. He could be whatever. He could be the marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Make him like a Scottish comedian. I don't fucking care. Make Give him, him a every fucking job. heckler. Maybe He'd he could be, be really good as a heckler. He could be a, like a Scottish cop on one of the Law and Order spinoffs. Mm-hmm. I do not put him in all the things. Mm-hmm. All of them. Just have him make a shit ton of money. Mm-hmm. He's the best. Yeah. Do you have other book questions? Oh, wait. Heather J. had a question besides the one about him being hot. Uh, uh, Tori, 655 p.m. I started squealing about Myrta so much that I woke up the cat. See, Sophie, that's why you're glad that you're deaf. Deaf. She couldn't hear Uh, shit. Heather J., I don't know if I'm too late, but I would love to your take on what feels like the drips and drabs we're getting of Roger and Bree. I love everything about Myrta this ep, but the R&B stuff is so thin. I don't really know what is motivating either of them. Maybe drop some in the books or spoil the knowledge on us. Um, This is honestly very close. So it's, and it's pretty straightforward. 
Oh God, she's loving her radiator. <laughs> she loves that um, guy. She, so Brianna finds out what happened to Claire and Jamie when Roger didn't tell her because she's a fucking, an she's adult. doing it. She's sister's she's like, doing it for herself. She Googled, right? Like <laughs> she found out she went to the reference section of the library. Right? That's the 1970s version of Google. She found out and decided to go back in time to warn them, by the way, you're going to die in a house fire. Oh, shit balls. Who could Hold that on. be? It can't be my husband unless he forgot his keys. I'm just, you would do your thing. I'm just going to keep talking. Okay. Um, so that's that. And then there's also... Hello? Hold on. Oh, does he need that sign? I bet he does. All right. Um, uh, anyway, Four. Roger and Bree. And uh, yeah, and then Roger goes after her. That's it. Anyway, love you. Bye. <laughs> Wait, who 